My name is Richard Gardner Whitson Sr., Dick Whitson. I was born in 1929 in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we family moved to Ridgewood, New Jersey, one of the little commuting towns up north in northern New Jersey. Uh, and I uh, went to Ridgewood High School. Uh, I went to Rutgers University and became very active in the ROCC. I was uh, cadet captain of the Scarlet Rifles drill team and was offered a regular commission when I graduated, which I turned down. At, at Rutgers, I was a business, business administration major. About halfway through, I took some aptitude tests and I was told I should have gone to art school. Uh, but I graduated with a uh, BS in business administration. Uh, I graduated in June of 1951 and got my second lieutenant bars. Uh, the fall of 51, I went down to Fort Benning to the uh, company officers course and was there uh, through December. In January, I went through jump school, took six jumps. The last jump, parachute didn't open and I came down around the reserve. That was my last jump. I wanted to go to the 82nd or 101st or some airborne outfit, but they were looking for line infantry officers in Korea and I was on the train to Korea. Uh, from uh, Benning, I went down, went uh, back to New Jersey to Fort Dix, uh, training recruits, and uh, I really felt that by the time I was in Korea, I really had some pretty good training with uh, the company officers course, jump school, and troop duty at uh, Fort Dix. Uh, I took the, I had months leave before I went to Korea, and a friend and I took a leisurely drive across country, had a wonderful time. He dropped me off in Seattle and uh, I sailed from there on the Marine Adder uh, and arrived in Yokohama sometime in early October. I sailed from Seattle on the Marine Adder and uh, we were very short of officers but have a whole lot of enlisted men and the things almost got out of hand. Uh, the uh, the only way you could get any work assignments done was collect their meal cards. They couldn't eat without the cards, and when the work detail was done, you gave them their cards back. We sailed into Yokohama uh, and arrived there early October. I spent two weeks then at Gifu at a CBR, Chemical, Biological, and Radiological Warfare uh, training, which was because uh, all the officers went through it at that time. Uh, then we sailed to uh, Pusan and went by, from, by train from Pusan up to uh, Seoul and from there we trucked up to the 7th Division. Uh, I had, they asked us what division we wanted to go with and I think my first choice was the uh, 187 uh, Regimental Combat Team, the Airborne Outfit. Uh, that didn't have a, didn't, that didn't fly. Then I thought the 2nd Division had that nice great big patch and the first cab had another great big patch, but I ended up in the 7th Division. And I must say, I'm very pleased to be there. I was assigned to the 7th Division, and we trucked into Division Headquarters and spent some time there. Uh, we were supposed to have something like a four-day orientation, but uh, all hell was breaking loose across the front, and they could cut the, they just stopped the four-day orientation. Uh, and uh, I was, there was about seven of us, and I think five out of the seven ended up in the 17th Regiment. So I arrived in Korea October of 52 uh, and was assigned to the 17th Infantry. Uh, and we were uh, roughly in the uh, Chorwon area, although they say the company was shifted all over the place. We were, every night we were in a different place. Uh, in the, we were in the uh, Jane Russell Triangle Hill battle and then were pulled off the line and spent most of uh, November, December uh, down in Kojido. Uh, then February we came back online and we were in the pork chop area a little bit to the east of pork chop and that was when we had uh, the uh, uh, the patrol ambushes where Webster was killed and then two nights later when uh, Sullivan's patrol was hit. Uh, then I, uh, I was a company executive officer under uh, Gorman Smith 
to March when I was transferred back to uh, regimental headquarters as a liaison officer. And I spent the rest of my time uh, in that role and uh, rotated home uh, in June. Uh, at, at the 17th uh, regimental headquarters, we met Colonel Royal Reynolds, who was the regimental commander, and uh, he briefed us on the regiment and uh, told us it had been in Sykes uh, Corps at Gettysburg and at Fredericksburg, and we really knew it was an old-time regiment. He gave us our buffalo nickels and our crossed rifles with the 17 on it, and uh, we were told and believed it was a very proud outfit. Uh, I was then assigned down to Easy Company the 17th. Our company commander was uh, Captain Sims. He was a short, wiry, ex-82nd Airborne guy who'd all been, he'd done every jump uh, that the 82nd had done in Europe. Uh, real, real seasoned, uh, seasoned officer. Uh, my platoon sergeant was Jim Sackrider, great big, tall football playing guy. Uh, and if you want to know what's about the toughest thing in the world, it's a green second lieutenant coming in to taking over a platoon in combat. You, you feel like uh, you feel like a little kid. Um, but they were a great bunch of guys. Uh, about a quarter of the platoon were Katusas. Uh, these were Korean Army training with the U.S. Army, and only one could speak English. We had one, Tommy was the interpreter, and uh, these Katusas spoke no English. Uh, in addition, uh, they had broken up two of the regiments earlier when they uh, went into integration, the 24th Regiment, which was a black regiment, and the 65th, which is Puerto Rican. And so we also had a good number of Puerto Ricans who didn't speak English. So we were going into combat with maybe a third of the platoon not speaking English. Uh, we, were we were located, the, the best of my ability, it was sort of west of uh, Kumwa Valley. We we're online. One reason I'm a little vague is that, say, all hell was breaking, breaking loose in the division front. and. Uh, it had been fairly quiet during the summer and, er and spring, uh, but October, uh, things hit the fan. And the, uh, uh, our company was switched almost every day and every night to a new position. And we were told at one point uh, we were the company res Corps Reserve. Uh, uh, the other officers in the uh, company were uh, Tom Fernandez de la Reguera. We called him Fernandez at the time. We'd not, we'd, the deal or Guerra was a little long for us. And uh, Davis was the, Tom was the first platoon leader, I was the second, and Davis was the third. Um, at some point we were in some, uh, again a place I don't know, uh, in, a, in a bunker that was one of the rocks had built and was not very substantial, and we started to get some shelling. And uh, this is kind of, I guess this is my first time under artillery fire. And the, uh, we all were kind of, all the company officers were in this one kind of flimsy bunker. And uh, I'm trying to keep as far away from the door as I can. When Tom uh, thinks it's a good idea to sh shoot rats with his 45. And so I, I'm thinking, but I don't mind uh, getting shot up by the Chinese, but I sure don't want to get shot up by some lieutenant trying to shoot rats in the ceiling. Uh, but Tom was a great guy and uh, he had, he had, uh, in an action just before I got there, Charlie Outpost, uh, Tom had gotten the uh, Silver Star. And uh, one of the officers that had come in with me at the same time, Stu Blazer, a Princeton graduate, uh, he was killed at, that, the, at Charlie Outpost, and uh, as was Ron Holland, who was uh, one of the officers that had gone to uh, Fort Benning with. I, I, actually, I, I felt that uh, I was about as well trained as I could be, probably better, better trained than the officers going out of OCS into uh, war, in World War II. Uh, but I had, I, I think the training at, at Fort Benning was excellent. Uh, I felt I'd got to prove myself at jump school. And the uh, troop duty at Fort Benning, uh, Fort, excuse me, Fort Dix was also very good. We did a lot of night operations. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they, we, we started training the troops in, with, in bayonet, which they had dropped for a long time. Apparently, they felt that the, uh, 
we weren't closing with the enemy as aggressively as we should, and they started bayonet training again. But I, I felt that by the time I got to Korea, Korea uh, I couldn't have been better trained or prepared. However, uh, coming in as a green second lieutenant uh, to an, an outfit in combat, they all looked like, uh, like uh, Bill Malden's guys, a bunch of rough, tough guys, and you felt like some skinny kid. But, and there was a little bit of testing that goes on, too. They kind of try you out. And uh, uh, you have to kind of prove yourself to them before they, uh, they go with you. Um, uh, my first combat experience uh, turned out not to be a real dilly. That uh, I just got back to uh, company headquarters when a call came in. Uh, George Company, the 17th, had retaken a, uh, an outpost in the Kumwa Valley that the Rocks had lost. And we were to, my platoon was to go out and to relieve the uh, George Company people. Uh, so they, we trucked over to the MLR, the Main Line of Resistance, uh, before we went out to the outpost. And uh, we looked around, we were supposed to report to a major who was supposed to give us our assignment. Couldn't find him. And some captain points out into the valley, and here's this little rock outcropping popping up there in the middle of this flat valley. And uh, just about that time, all these men are streaming back there on litters or walking wounded. Uh, one artillery officer, uh, forward observer, came in bleeding from a bad eye wound, and all he kept saying was, uh, you, know, you know, look out for the mines, keep down, look out for the mines, and he was just in a state of shock. Uh, then the, another officer was talking to the captain who brought us up, and he's, he's saying, I don't think my men will go out there again, and that, that didn't help me out a whole lot to build my morale. But we started out a uh, very long trail and separated uh, by large intervals we could to uh, try to keep from drawing artillery fire. Uh, about halfway out, I saw my first dead GI, and uh, apparently his head had been blown off, and someone had uh, very nicely put a sandbag uh, over it, so you couldn't see that. I thought he looked a rather peculiar color, and realized later on it was a black man and all the blood had drained out of him and uh, that was my first dead GI I had seen and that that kind of shakes you up. Uh, we got out to this rock outcropping and in this uh, this long trail uh, there was it was almost pure rock there was hardly any dirt on it at all this this uh, sheer just sheer sides we got up about about this far and uh, they started, we got to this point, and we ran into the other, the platoon that we were believing. And they pulled out, and there was another section here that we needed to be checked out. Uh, so I, I correctly told Jim Sackrider, the platoon sergeant, we should send a, let's send the, uh, a squad up there to take a look at it. And Jim says, uh, why don't you and I go? And of course, this was the wrong decision. The, platoon leader and platoon sergeant shouldn't be going out on, the, on a point by themselves like that. But I think it was uh, either one Jim was thinking of the first squad and trying to take care of the guys, or he, or maybe it was a little test of the green second lieutenant. Anyway, Jim and I went out to this other point, and this had been the main uh, outpost for the, uh, for the, on that, on that, uh, mound. Uh, I'm a little confused about what it was. Uh, I don't think it was White Horse. Joe Gonzalez was telling me he thinks it was Iron Horse. Um, at this point, there was nothing but rocks. There was no, no sand or no dirt to, to build bunkers with. The bunkers had all been built out of rocks. The sandbags were, were full of rocks. And it was just a brutal killing zone. Whatever you know, artillery fire fell in there, uh, with just ricocheted all, all around this place. Uh, there were, when we got up there, there was two of the most horribly mutilated bodies, uh, Chinese uh, soldiers that I've ever seen. One was sitting bolt upright and was just sheared from belt right up through the neck, just no, no front at all. The other uh, 
must have either been burned by white phosphorus or a flamethrower. I never saw anybody with a flamethrower, but he was body was totally burned and back, you know, lying in an arch position. Um, the uh, Jim and I realized that we we shouldn't be up there, two people without any cover, and we went back to the other position, back in this area. Uh, we were supposed to be being relieved by a rock company, and we waited and we waited, and then we started to get sh get shelling, and we moved down into the area down here, on the reverse slope, and there were no no holes or no uh, no cover except for some boulders, and with the shells coming over the hill. I couldn't decide whether I was supposed to be on this side of the boulder or that side of the boulder, and I remember Tommy, the uh, interpreter, who'd seen a lot of action, he told me which one was the right one, which now I forgot which one was the right one. Uh, this, this, was, uh, this, this, this was now maybe a uh, very late afternoon, and we were supposed to be relieved by this rock company. Uh, it wasn't particularly cold as I remember, or maybe I so distracted I don't remember. But we, uh, we were, I remember the, uh, got a radio call from uh, the company commander back in the main line, uh, sending what did I need, and I remember saying, uh, we need holes. I thought that sounded very, like a war movie kind of thing to say. And uh, eventually, uh, now getting on dark, uh, just about, I guess, seven or eight o'clock at night, the, the rocks showed up. and. Uh, they kind of squatted down there at the bottom of the hill, and I kept wanting to come up and relieve us. And uh, this rock uh, captain, he kept not he kept not moving and not moving. And so finally, I said, "Listen, if you either you come up here or I'm pulling out." Uh, Sack Rider and I, you know, realized that uh, we were in a bad spot all by just two people. We needed we couldn't even cover each other, and uh, went back to the other position where the rest of the platoon was. And we moved further down the hill into this area, and uh, we're receiving shelling down there. Um, at about I don't know six thirty, seven o'clock at night, the the rocks company that was to relieve, relieve us showed up, but instead of coming up on the hill with uh, where the platoon was, they squatted down here in the rice paddies behind the uh, on the bottom of the hill. Uh, I kept trying to convince the rock company commander to come relieve us, and. Uh, they just kind of kept sitting there, so I threatened that I would take my platoon out and and uh, just you know leave them where they were. Uh, so I started down the uh, down the hill and back down the trail, back to the main line of resistance. And my gosh, the rocks stood up and came back with us. Um, uh, and we we were all mixed up together and coming back. And I kept thinking, boy, we're, we're just going to be red meat for any Chinese patrol that's out there. But we all got back safely and. Uh, and that kind of that kind of ended that that mission. The next action was uh, our seventeenth uh, assault on Jane Russell. The, the next action that I was in was a little later in the month. I'm going to say sixteenth or seventeenth of uh, October uh, was the assault on uh, Jane Russell. Um, the, the hill had been fought over before we got there any number of days, a uh, uh, fellow named Schulwalter, uh, who I'd been at summer camp with, ROTC summer camp, got the Congressional Medal of Honor on Jane Russell about the day before we got there. Uh, say we, we had been trucked all up and down the division front, and we didn't know where we were, and we pulled up by the hill, and we didn't know what it, that it was Jane Russell or the or Triangle Hill or what it was. Uh, we were just told, uh, we were to make this assault. Uh, I was to lead off with uh, with the uh, second platoon. Tom Fernandez with the second uh, sec first platoon, uh, going to echelon off to my left. He uh, uh, further up the hill, and Davis with the third platoon in between us. Uh, so I was to the right, Davis, and then uh, Tom. Um, that. Captain Sims uh, briefed us. Uh, the briefing wasn't much except uh, uh, you go down this hill and uh, there it is. Uh, Whitson to the right, and Davis to the middle, and uh, Fernandez uh, to the left. Uh, we had, we had uh, and he ordered, at that time we didn't have uh, armored vests, 
and uh, somehow they got three armored vests, and he ordered Tom and Davis and myself to wear the armored vests. Uh, and he says, looked at it, he says, this is a direct order, you'll wear the armored vests. Um, so we, uh, I ordered Sack Rider to uh, bring up the rear, figured the two platoon leaders should not be in the same position, and uh, Jim had a flare at the end of his rifle to shoot off. It was to lift the uh, covering machine gun fire, which was coming from tanks behind us. Uh, tanks, the tanks were down in, in this area. So I headed off. I remember saying to, to Tom uh, Fernandez, I hope this is an easy one. And he says, none of them are easy. You know, that, that didn't help very much. So uh, we started off down the road here. The tanks were back here giving us uh, covering fire with their machine guns. And we, you know, I said we didn't know that this was Jane Russell or that was Jane Russell or something. We knew this was the hill. Uh, we got down here, and the uh, correct procedure would have been for me to stop there and the platoon stretch out in the skirmish line and go up together as a skirmish line. In the excitement of it, I just went straight up the hill. Uh, Tom Jury, the, uh, Bob Jury, the, uh, first squad leader right beside me. We went right up the hill and started uh, pulling grenades and dumping them in the holes that were in the bunkers that were there, frying them first to be sure they didn't come flying back at us. But we, we, there was absolutely no resistance. We got the whole platoon up, up in the hill without casualties. I think one man was hurt by uh, uh, a machine gun round that had set up some splinters or something, but that, that was, we had no casualties at all. Uh, the uh, Tom, I, I, I presume the rest of the company had, didn't have uh, casualties either, but apparently Tom did hit some, uh, being for, much further up to the left, apparently he did come under some fire up there, which, which uh, surprised me when I heard that. I didn't know that at the time. The, uh, the, the hill was, uh, was really steep, and there were dead GIs on the hill from the, from the attacks that had been there previously, and that was kind of, that was a little, kind of shook you up. Uh, the hill dropped off dramatically to the side here, and there was one trench still intact up here, and there were a few bunkers and things here, but most of them pretty much caved in. The front of the hill was just one mass of, uh, of caved-in bunkers, and uh, the Chinese were still in there. And every time, if you got too far around here, or caused too, much, uh, too many bodies in one place, there was a 76 that would fire from up here, presumably from a tank. And they just, you got too many people there, and they just slam around right in there. So while we were up here in, the, in this trench area, uh, the, uh, I remember one of the guys I thought was pretty gutsy, took a 45 and went down in the holes and looked to see what he could find, and he came back and said he thought it looked like a hospital. And just about that time, uh, we looked down, and here's this Chinese guy wandering down the slope. And he's, he is obviously in bad shape. His pants are down around his ankles and his nose, it's nose running and he's uh, pretty sick. So we're all kind of standing up here, uh, not wanting to go down this forward slope because of the, all the Chinese still in the um, burned out, bunk, blown out bunkers here and the 76 firing down on us. And uh, so now we're getting another little test of the platoon leader. One of the guys says, well, if I had an armored vest, I'd go down there. So I grabbed Tommy, the interpreter, which didn't make any sense since he spoke Korean and we were going to try to go out and get the Chinese guy. And we got down there, down this main slope, this steep slope, and it was all kind of ash and gravel and very steep, and kind of caught between the devil and the deep blue sea with the Chinese up here in the 76, going to fire if there's too much commotion down there. So we, uh, we're trying to get this guy to come back up and Tommy draws his bayonet and trying to draw a red cross in the sand, and the poor Chinese guy sees that bayonet, and he freaks out. So about that time, I think the only way to get him, get him up there is to knock him out, and I'm not very proud of this. I, I hit him, get him a vertical buck stroke with my uh, carbine, which then broke the stock and didn't seem to phase him at all. But we, uh, we wrestled him back up the slope and got him back up here on the, on the hill, and uh, there were, those, those days they were very pleased to get prisoners. Uh, and I don't know what information they got out of this guy. I heard later on that he was he was doped up or something. But uh, the uh, 
then the other, the other incident that, outstanding incident that happened, uh, that we were we were up there. I think from Thursday, Thursday to uh, to uh, Sunday. Uh, we, we've been up there about three days and uh, we're pretty scroungy, and uh, we'd get people coming to see us. Uh, Father Rooney, the Catholic chaplain who we're all very fond of, he, he, he would pop up there and I remember the Red Cross guy came up with donuts or something and uh, of course they'd come up there kind of wide-eyed because this was right at the front as far as they were concerned. And we got a uh, replacement joined us uh, and he was, his, remember his name was Jones and he'd been in Germany and he volunteered uh, for uh, Korea and he came bounding up the hill, and we were all pretty messy. And he came up all nice and fresh and crisp. And we always called him R.A. Jones. He said, "I'm just, um, I just, uh, I just came here, and I just signed up regular army." And he was always R.A. Jones. Uh, then just before we were, we left the hill, uh, we were relieved by another platoon. I can't remember from what outfit, but uh, if I could go over and show you here again, we were. Uh, we, I think we made the assault on a Thursday, and on Sunday we were to be relieved. And the relieving platoon came up the back of the hill to join us. And uh, uh, the sack rider and myself and the new platoon leader and his platoon sergeant and uh, my company medic, Doc Turpin, who was always a real busybody, insisted on joining us. And the five of us are standing there, but all of a sudden we hear this uh, incoming round whistle, and it was a real real steep sharp one and a mortar round landed right in the middle of our group and it hit the hit the sole of the uh, shoe of the medic and of course the minute we heard the whistling we all kind of dove for cover uh, and it turned out to be a dud and here's this thing sticking there right in the ground uh, uh, I suspect both sides had a lot of faulty ammunition because a lot of it was left over from uh, World War II um, but that probably was the closest call I've had was that, that mortar around between the two of us. Also, also I remember the, uh, I wanted to uh, show the new platoon leader what the situation was up there. And so I, I took him around to the, the, front of the uh, front of the hill and I said, the thing you have to watch out for is that 76 and just that time, wham, here comes the 76 and uh, also the whole time we were up there, uh, we, were, we were putting, throwing dynamite charges into the front of the bunkers and, uh, you know, uh, especially at night, the Chinese would try to come out and guys would try to pick them off. Uh, I remember Davis complaining that I wasn't doing my share of the uh, uh, charges in there. And I, the truth was, I didn't, wasn't too crazy about charges and didn't do too much of that. The, the Chinese, you know, and it was probably true all, all along in all the Chinese positions, that their main positions were in the, in the reverse slope of the hill because, because we were, you know, our, it's the, heavy firepower. And so, so, the, so the main Chinese installation had been in the back and it was already all broken down and chewed up, but the main bunkers of the Chinese room were in the back. Although there were some, a few of them must have been firing positions in the front. And uh, so, the, so the whole time we were there, the Chinese kept dribbling out, especially at night they would try to slip out. And we would uh, try to blow them out with dynamite charges during the daytime and try to pick them off and then try to slip out. They said we couldn't go around the, the, the face of that, you know, what was our now forward slope, uh, because of the 76 that was, that would, every time you get any kind of uh, movement up there, 76 would come in. I, I, I suspect that the mortar round, the single mortar round that hit, uh, I kept wondering where that, that could have come from, and I kind of wondered if it was the new company coming in and was, you know, uh, trying to zero their mortars in and had let one fly by mistake or something, but. I don't think that was true because Joe Gonzalez, who was uh, the uh, weapons platoon leader, they were still in place and they stayed there a couple of days after we left, so that wasn't true. I think now that the Chinese still were up in this area, up in Pikes Peak, that hadn't been taken, and I think they had observation up there, and I think they saw the uh, commotion and you know, build up of uh, guys up there on the hill, and they just thought they'd drop one in on us. The only support we got was uh, during the assault when we had the, uh, we had the machine gun covering us, you know, from the tanks. And they were, they were, they were clipping right over our heads and uh, a sack rider who I'd told to stay in the rear, I turned around and found he was right beside me and he fired the, uh, the rifle flare and that lifted the machine gun fire. After we pulled off, we, I think we were, we were lucky that 
I say the, the assaults earlier, uh, they were dead GIs on the hill. It, it had been a real, a real tough battle. I think we were just plain lucky. And after we pulled off, they, they counterattacked, and uh, they just said they dumped, Chinese dumped so much stuff on there, it was almost an uh, you know, un, unlivable place. Uh, so I think just, we were just very lucky as a company to have uh, gotten out of there. Yeah, as I say, as we went up the hill, there were you know, dead GIs on the hill. And uh, then you know, once we got ourselves uh, established, we started digging in. And uh, as you'd start to dig, uh, you'd come across a body, and a Chinese body, and you'd move three feet to the right and dig again. And uh, they were you know, all over the hill. Most of them had been, been buried up by, uh, by uh, debris, debris from the shell fire and so forth. And they were in all the bunkers down below, which, which we didn't, we didn't go into, that they were, they were just full of bodies down there. Yeah, uh, after this we got a real break that we were pulled off the line and uh, uh, were sent down guarding prisoners down in Kojido. And uh, we sailed out of Incheon and went down to Kojido. And this, this was a real break because we were, regiment was down there through the holidays and uh, couldn't have been better. And we were guarding prisons, but we also ran some very good uh, training exercises. Uh, we did some live fire uh, assaults with uh, tanks and uh, live ammunition, and uh, it was very, 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 very good training. Um, uh, when, we, when we returned from uh, Kojido, uh, we were online in the Porkchop Hill area. Uh, our company was a little bit to the right of Porkchop Hill. Uh, when, uh, after, after uh, the attack on Jane Russell, during the attack on Jane Russell, uh, the company was taken over by uh, Sandy Polson, and Sandy was an ex-Marine and had tried for a Marine commission and couldn't get one and uh, got an Army commission instead. And Sandy was a good, good salty, down-to-earth guy. And uh, he'd been our, the company commander all the way or through Kojido. And uh, when we got back online, uh, uh, Davis and uh, Fernandez had moved back, uh, I guess, to uh, headquarters, reg regimental headquarters, and we had uh, three replacement officers. Uh, and at that time, I was going to be uh, the uh, weapons platoon leader, which I thought was just terrific, because I thought that, uh, that was as good as being back at Seoul. You didn't go on patrols and this kind of thing, and wow, this was like rear echelon almost. Uh, two of the three replacements were a little shaky. Uh, I didn't I didn't think they were real infantry officer material. And uh, after when I, I got back online, I went on R&R, &R, and when I, when I returned, uh, Polson had gone, and uh, Lieutenant Webster was the company commander. Lieutenant Webster was a uh, West Point graduate, uh, Warren Webster III. Uh, he'd been, a, he'd been uh, with a uh, line company, but more recently had been a uh, uh, Webster was, had been a uh, general's aide and had requested uh, more troop duty, and has, so he had been uh, assigned to us as company commander. Uh, I found also that the two of the replacement officers had disappeared, and I think this happened fairly frequently, that officer didn't cut the mustard, they pulled him out and sent him to the rear somewhere. So this meant uh, the only officers in the company were uh, Webster, myself, and uh, Lieutenant Bremer, who was an also a World War II vet, and he was more of an administrative officer. Uh, so then, so I now picked up the third platoon, so back with a back with a rifle platoon. Um, and uh, Webster Webster planned a patrol. And of course, we were always you know, trying to capture prisoners. That was the main reason for the patrol action that we went on. And we would patrol, uh, I've kind of forgotten now what the sequence was, but we'd have a, a patrol, a night patrol went out from the company maybe once a week and uh, daytime small, you know, uh, sergeant-led patrols would go out during the daytime. Uh, the uh, Webster had planned this one, one patrol, ambush patrol, and his idea was to uh, 
go out with the two groups, which you usually did. We usually had a uh, the main group and then a support group, and you kept them separate. And he was going to uh, go out with a small six-man group and fire a couple of rounds off and make noises like he like someone was wounded and hope to draw the Chinese out into a uh, into a an ambush. And so he took the patrol out, and I I must say that. It was unusual for company commanders to take out a patrol, and as the uh, you know other officer of the company, the logical thing would have been for me to take it out. But he, bless him, he took the patrol out himself, and uh, we occupied the main line of resistance back here with our company. And we had outposts on uh, Uncle and Yoke, and these were pretty far out. You went out to them by truck. Uh, his patrol was to be out in this area. And uh, I was back in the main line of resistance with the third platoon. I was the, the backup if he got into trouble. Uh, so this was the night of February 21st. And uh, sure enough, at some point, we start hearing small arms fire and uh, grenades going off. And they had made contact. Uh, later on, the report was that he had run into or run into a, what had run to him was two company of Chinese coming down to make an, uh, an assault on Arsenal. They believed this because Arsenal was hit on this side and they think there was a two-prong approach uh, attack coming down here. Uh, so I took my, we loaded up my third platoon on trucks and we went down to, through Yoke, to Uncle to Yoke and uh, I stopped off at at Yoke to report to the battalion commander, Major Noble, and uh, he said, well, you know, let me know with, by your radio operator what's going on and so forth. And uh, at that point I said, I, I don't think I have got a radio operator. And Mort Kaz, who'd been the radio operator, uh, the, the uh, relay from the patrol, bless him, said, I, I'll, I'll go with you. And he volunteered. My, my platoon sergeant had already gotten the platoon pretty far out, and I had to kind of bar out there and catch up with them. Uh, we, we, we started a skirmish line, and you know, it's one thing if you're going out on a patrol and you, you might make contact with the enemy. In this situation, you hear the, you hear the grenades and the burp guns going off, and you know you're going to get into it. And so we, we got about, a, about as, I don't know, this far, this across the rice paddies, and uh, as we approached, uh, the Chinese started to stop firing. And they, had, they weren't too sure how big a force we were, and so they, uh, they kind of backed off. And we could see some of them kind of drifting away. And as we got up closer, uh, I went a little too far, and uh, one of the Katusas uh, stopped me, and, uh, and I think he saved my life. Because I think I was, I was right over I think there was a Chinaman there with a burp gun, and if, if I had seen him, he would have blown me away. Uh, but I pulled back to where the uh, where the Katusa had was had was it stopped me, and uh, then oh, then the firefight opened up again, and uh, we were you know the, we were out in the middle of rice paddies. The only uh, protection were the little berms that you had, so it, so so we were. Uh, you know, basically in the rice paddy, there's no cover except for the little berms you know, between the rice paddies. And uh, uh, at that point, all, all hell broke loose. Uh, we were so close to, the, I'm probably going to exaggerate how close, but it, it seemed like about 10 yards, but we were close enough, we could hear them pull the pins on the grenade. You know, they were uh, match-fired grenades, the potato masher. And we'd hear them pull the thing and yell grenades, and we'd all kind of duck down behind the berm as much as we could. and the, Burp gun shells hit, <laughs> uh, splashing up between us. Uh, so I, I, I threw two grenades at where this guy had been, and uh, uh, Mort Katz, the radio man, gave me his grenades, and I threw those. And the, I think I got him because the uh, the uh, the guy who was spraying the world up with a burp gun stopped. Um, the uh, At that time, the platoon sergeant came up to me and, and said, you know, sir, I think we've got to pull back. We're, we're losing too many of the men ourselves. We're, getting, we're not going to be able to you know, help out taking these guys back. 
So, so we reluctantly we pulled back and came back. And as we were as we were coming back, we we brought as many of the wounded as we could, but we were still leaving a lot of them out there. And uh, the uh, we looked back and the company medic, uh, Malcolm Scott, apparently he had dropped in at the rear of my platoon as I was taking it out there, and he was still out there. And I ordered him, ordered him back, and he refused to come, and he stayed out there by himself. Uh, bravest, bravest thing I've ever seen, because uh, the Chinese were still all over the area, the firefight was still going on. So I came back, I came back to Yoke, and uh, the second platoon, which had been my old platoon, was on Yoke, and uh, they had been told to come down and help bring in the wounded. So a lot of them come down off of Yoke without their rifles. And I came in, uh, and I, I said, "Okay, we're going back. We're going back out there. Let's. We still got um, still got guys out there." And uh, so they said, "Well, we don't have our rifles." And I said, "You know, I, I don't give a damn. We're we're going back anyway," which was, of course, ridiculous. About that time, they kind of they kind of drifted off into the distance. But uh, we did go back out with a uh, part of the second platoon, and uh, Jack Sullivan was the platoon leader of, of, of that platoon, and a, a platoon or part of a platoon from George Company. And I remember, uh, I remember the uh, one of the sergeants said, uh, "You know, we always took our insignia off when we went out on patrol." And the sergeant said, uh, Gee, "Sir, you've still got your insignia on." Uh, so he he took great pleasure in taking them off and throwing them away. Uh, we. We headed back out, and we had now had a kind of a hard time finding the guys. That uh, there was no firefight going on at that time, and uh, we uh, we we got back out, and finally we heard Scott calling to us. And Scott had been wounded, and he'd been he'd built a little fire trying trying to take care of the wounded. And uh, later on, I, I think what had happened that platoon sergeant. Platoon sergeant, whose good buddy was one of the ones who had volunteered to go with uh, Webster on his, his patrol, uh, and I think this is the reason the platoon sergeant was anxious to get out there. He's worried about his friend, and he uh, he found he found uh, I can't think of his name. All of a sudden, he found his buddy, and his buddy was badly wounded, and the and the and he had asked uh, the platoon sergeant to kill him. And I think the platoon sergeant was pretty shaken up by this, and that's why kind of why he thought we should get out of there, because I didn't. It was very hard to tell whether it was a right decision or right or wrong. Uh, but uh, we couldn't. It was dark, black. We couldn't see how many wounded you have or didn't have. Uh, but when I got got back, and I was really pretty desperate to get back out there, I wasn't too sure we should have pulled out in the first place. But we came back out, and uh, we still had. More wounded that we can take care of, and so uh, Jack Sullivan came back and uh, to bring out some more guys, and I stayed out with them, and we were every now and then we'd make we'd we'd hear a little contact, a little burp gun would go off or something, and we'd we'd fire back, uh, and we still had a lot of wounded, and the uh, I was getting worried because we were right under the Chinese lines, we were you know very close to the Chinese lines. And the, uh, as the, uh, started to get worried because the sun was starting to come up. And just about that time, uh, Gorman Smith, who had been the, uh, he's a, Gorman was a West Pointer, it was the S2 at Battalion, he brought out a patrol, he had a little trouble finding us, and he kind of came out through this area and, uh, and caught up to us. And we, we then took out the rest of the wounded, and as we were pulling back, the sun was coming up, and we started to get rifle fire from Snook in Hill 22, 200, and uh, we got about here. And I remember the, ri the rifle rounds cracking over our heads and, and laughing because I thought, "Hey, we'd we'd fooled them. We'd gotten out." Uh, so we we kind of kind of came on came on back, and I came back to my bunker, and uh, been a long night, and uh, got a call from Major Noble, and he wanted me to go back out there with the tanks. And clean up the battlefield. So I went. I reported down to uh, where the how machine guns were, and they had the uh, one tank from the uh, I guess it was the 
you know, Sherman from the regimental tank company, and then uh, a bunch of the, I forget which ones they were, but they were the newer tanks from the uh, division tank company. So we, we started out with the tanks, and the one from the tank company are shooting up the hills and so forth, and uh, we go out here and park the tank, and about this time, uh, my glass is half full. I'd been out there all day and uh, trying to get out of there before the sun came up, and here we are out, out in broad daylight. And uh, so pretty soon, the, the, the bow gunner, the bogue, he gets out, and uh, the driver gets out, and the tank sergeant gets out, and they're going further and further away from the tank, and they're picking up bodies and putting them in the tank, and I'm just hunkered down there in the turret of the tank, and I'm I said, no way I'm getting out of this tank. And they're getting further and further away from the tank, and I'm, I'm trying, how the hell do you drive this thing? You know, they, these guys are crazy. And sure enough, all of a sudden, a, uh, there's an explosion. And at the time, we didn't know what it was. I didn't know whether it was a mortar round coming in or a 57 recoilless. And they come scampering back to the tank, and sure enough, the tank sergeant's got a head wound. He's got his tanker helmet on and a sh shrapnel or something going through the thing. He's bleeding, bleeding all over the place. So we start on back, and we've got uh, got uh, Chinese and GI bodies on the tank. And as we got back to uh, to uh, uh, battalion CP, and we're taking the uh, bodies off the tank. And I remember we were putting them near the uh, battalion aid station, and Doc Capel, who was uh, uh, battalion surgeon, wouldn't let us bring the bodies anywhere near the uh, the uh, aid station. Uh, and it turned out that. Uh, the bodies, both the GIs and the Chinese, had been booby-trapped. They'd put a, a hand, a potato masher grenade through a shirt and uh, leave the pin out. And so you, when you, on the guy, on the dead person's hand, and you picked up the hand, that pulled the grenade. So this is how the sergeant guy had been wounded. What we, what we found was that uh, the small group uh, of six who had been uh, a little bit further away from the main ambush group uh, that Webster was was a leader of. Uh, uh, Webster had been killed at that time, and uh, I remember when I went, went back to Yoke uh, the first time and reported to Major Noble, and uh, and he asked me about Webster, and I went. I told him that Webster had been killed. Um, the, I, I don't. I really really hard to, uh, specifically a number of, of casualties we had, but it was it was. Uh, it pretty much cleaned out the, the first platoon, who was the, uh, the platoon that was uh, uh, the ambush platoon. Uh, we, had, we had some casualties from uh, the third platoon that I took out, but most of them were the, were the ones who were out there originally. Um, now, another, about two nights after that, uh, we now had uh, we now had two officers in the company, myself and Bremer, and at the uh, at one of the briefings, uh, I was told may, perhaps I might get the company. Uh, I don't know if that was a possibility or not. But two nights later, we had uh, Jack Sullivan had a, pl a patrol out. Uh, this was on the night of February 24th, and uh, he had he had taken his his patrol up into this area, and I had a, taken a patrol up there uh, maybe a week before that, and both of us had come back through this area. And as Jack came back through here, he ran into Chinese ambush in this area. And uh, again, I was the relief platoon, and I took our guys down in the truck, and again, we, were, we heard the grenades going off and the burp guns going like crazy. And as we came down here, I got worried that we'd been had a lot of activity off of Yoke. We'd been coming in and out of there, and I and I thought, you know, that's not very smart. I'm going to cut over here, so I cut over this way, and uh, then I got worried because I didn't know where the minefields were, and I thought, oh my God, I'm leading. I may be leading the guys right through a minefield, and just to, and they weren't. I don't know whether it was February, whether the ground was hard enough, or whether we just never, didn't ever hit the minefields. But as we got about here, all of a sudden this artillery or mortar barrage just crash right around where we would have been coming off a yoke. And uh, uh, so for the, I made a, 
a good decision for the wrong reason. I would want it barely because I thought we might be ambushed coming off there, but I missed that birth's barrage. Later on at the debriefing, I was mentioned this to Major Noble, and I saw him look at the uh, S3, and I suspect it was our own barrage. I think they, I think they had called in the protective fires around Yoke. Uh, so I went out, and uh, by that time, the Chinese had drifted away as we approached, and they had taken uh, two of the guys prisoners. Chester Bowen was one, and I forget what the other one was. And uh, uh, Sullivan was wounded. Uh, he was he was still on his feet. He was walking wounded. Uh, Roger Cavaluso, who was a uh, short, feisty ex 82nd Airborne guy, he was wounded. He was, but he was still walking around. Uh, Herbie Golden, who was uh, a really sweet guy, who was uh, had been with us all the way through the uh, Jane Russell uh, fight. Uh, uh, he was seriously wounded, a machine gunner, and he was he was seriously wounded, and he died before we could get him back in. But he was such a sweet, cheerful guy. He was one of the best liked guys in the company. Uh, but we got we got them got them all back in. Uh, and at this time, the company was really decimated. We'd, we'd had really good luck all through October. The battles there had taken very few casualties. Uh, then all of a sudden, in two, in two nights, we, we practically wiped out the company. Um, I say they, they talked about, Major Noble talked about my taking over the company. Uh, but instead of that, Gorman Smith came down as company commander, and I became company executive officer. Uh, if I'd gotten the company, I probably would have stayed in. I think I uh, felt like, well, if there's no, another West Point is always going to take your job. Uh, so, the, uh, so shortly after that, uh, I left the company. I was transferred back as a liaison officer. And uh, as far as I was concerned, that might as well be back in Seoul. That, uh, uh, but I had to leave the guys. And the they, they, company then went on uh, in one of the battles of Pork Chop Hill. And Gorman did a hell of a job. Uh, one of one of his attacks, they'd, ha they'd been having frontal attacks up Porkchop. He took the company around to the reverse slope and attacked up the reverse slope. I think one of the, you know, the really smart things of uh, Porkchop Hill. Uh, for the action the night that uh, Webster was killed, uh, I, I I was awarded the Silver Star, and Mort Katz, the uh, radio man. Uh, received a bronze star very deservedly. Uh, the one who was shortchanged was Malcolm Scott. Uh, his action was obviously so heroic, we just assumed that he was obviously going to get something, and uh, he did not. He did not, didn't get a, any award. Uh, after the war, uh, somewhere around time around 56, Jack Sullivan and I uh, uh, did a write-up for him, and he did receive a silver star. We felt he should have deserved a lot more. Uh, also, also, Warren Webster, uh, at the time, at that time his wife was pregnant and uh, he had a, a son born after he was killed. Not too long ago, about six months ago, I received a call from his son who lives over in uh, North Carolina and we got together and had lunch, just a, a charming young man, and uh, he gave me, loaned me letters that his father had written home, and uh, uh, I really felt I'd really gotten to know him better through reading the letters. But it was, it was a very, very sad, very sad thing. One of the men I admired most that I served with was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Metaxas, and uh, he was the assistant regimental commander at the time. And we would regularly see him up in the front lines, which was or in, on, even on the outpost which was pretty unusual for uh, the senior officers. Uh, and he told me later on that he would keep a little tick file to be sure that he did this regularly. And he was one of the few officers that, that we saw regularly. Although we'd see uh, General Smith fly over in his helicopter around then, and you'd salute him and he'd salute you back. And the, uh, uh, I, got, I got to know General Metaxas better when I was liaison officer back, at, back, back with the regiment. And, uh, uh, we had a, a regimental headquarters at the officers' club. We had uh, a giant uh, veterinarian syringe, and it 
had buffalo piss written on it. And every time we had guests, they'd have a mock injection of this uh, hypodermic needle. Uh, and there was another, uh, like a, the buffalo probe that had a, uh, was, was uh, like a, a swagger stick with a hook on the end of it or something. That was the buffalo probe. And, and Dermal Texas loved to, you know, initiate visitors to the regimental mess. Um, and I got to know him. Uh, he and I both took a trip down to, uh, down to Seoul. Uh, I thought I was going to stay in the Army, and uh, I took my uh, uh, medical, uh, medical down in Seoul. And he went down for, I think, I believe he was being prom promoted to full colonel and was uh, taking a medical for that reason. And uh, so, so the, uh, so the uh, Jeep driver and I decided we'd, we'd rather stay someplace else. And when we picked the general up and the colonel up in the morning, uh, he said, gee, you must have been right in the middle of that air raid. And the two of us said, uh, what air raid? And it turned out that the Chinese had come over in biplanes and uh, maybe for the only time uh, dropped uh, bombs and hand grenades on the Yangdong Po airfield and set an oil dump on fire. Um, also, uh, uh, General, uh, I keep calling him General Metaxas, had written a, uh, a reference for me for uh, staying in the, in the Army, in the regular Army. And I, years later, I read this uh, reference, uh, and uh, he talked about my getting a Bronze Star for administrative duties as a liaison officer. So uh, at, the, uh, at the next reunion, I told him about this, and he said, oh, send me a copy of that, and I'll see what I can do. And then he makes the motions of making a pair of paper airplane and launching it in the air. So I never got me bron my Bronze Star. <laughs> but it, uh, General Metaxas was a very fine officer, a very fine man. That uh, I know when other officers would go on leave in RRR in Japan, he'd go and he'd spend his time with one of the uh, foreign troops. He always seemed to have an affinity for the foreign troops and the, the Thailanders or the Colombians or something. And, uh, then I, I, I rotated home in June of 53. Uh, carrying with me all the my regular army application, which I had never turned in, and went went on back to civilian life. So, as a liaison officer, uh, I was there during the first battle of Porkchop Hill, and uh, it it just it what it, it seemed to me is like uh, even nobody at regimental headquarters really knew what was going on. It was uh, terribly confusion, but. Uh, uh, I'd go up on the, behind Pork Chop Hill. I was never on the hill when there was actual fighting going on, but I would be back behind the lines at the aid station, and uh, boy, all those bad feelings came back. It was uh, Triangle Hill and all the bad stuff we went through all over again. Uh, so I, I was happy not to be back with the. I felt guilty not being with the company because they were they were in it, but uh, I was very happy not to be there. I was happy to be back where I was. Yeah, that, that uh, one of the few times I went up there when the. Uh, fighting was going on was uh, at the aid station, which I presume was the 1st Battalion aid station, which was directly at the foot of, uh, of Porkchop Hill. The uh, you know, other, other man I'd like, I'd like to comment on was uh, Doc Capel, who was uh, the, our 2nd our, uh, Battalion uh, surgeon. Uh, uh, Doc Capel was a, a, a black man who was, everybody in the battalion just respected him. He was a very fine man. And uh, I've got a picture of him uh, digging his own aid station, which I think was, was quite incredible. But uh, he was one of the finer men in the, in the, uh, in the battalion.